<laughs> and you may have seen it. A couple of things that I am, and probably you are also, uh, ready to go away. Right? One of them is this term, the new normal. We were just speak, uh, thinking this afternoon in our lives. Uh, you do get, there are, there, there are times in a person's life where they have pretty much had a routine. My, my dad lived in the same house from the time I was a little baby up until just a few years ago. Uh, he actually moved to Florida from Michigan. I don't know why old people do that. If I ever get old, maybe I'll understand it. But, uh, but you know, he pretty much had the same routine. He would get up in the same uh, bedroom and he would uh, uh, go out the same door, down the same hallway, through the same living and dining room, into the kitchen, same uh, coffee pot, same Bible, sitting on the kitchen table, and uh, same alarm clock would go off before all that started, and he would get in the car and go and, and go to work and, and, and do something like that for years at a time. I've always envied that. I've always wanted to have the stability of just having a routine that very rarely changes. I want whatever my normal is, I am secure when I am in a place where I know what to expect next. And uh, now sometimes you may have a car that ages, wears out, blows up, gets in a wreck, whatever, and you get a different vehicle. So the rest of your life and your routine is pretty much the same, but there's something that's a little bit different, and you get used to that, you make an adjustment to it, uh, and that is becomes what you might be able to call, this is, this is what I normally do now. Uh, maybe at some point you'll get a different job, or you'll retire, or you'll uh, have something else uh, happen in your life, and you'll uh, remodel a room, or do an addition, or buy a different house, which is still, the rest of your life is about the same thing. Now you might get to an age where your kids start moving away, right? And all of your life, maybe for the first uh, year or two or more as you're in your marriage, uh, and, and even at that point, you just made a big adjustment, right? When you, you're a single person, you're living at home, that's your home. You get on a school bus, that's your home. And so things do change constantly enough that uh, as long as they happen slowly enough, and predictably enough, and you have a, a little uh, advance notice that some of these things are coming, it makes it a little easier to take. But sometimes, uh, sometimes you, you have things happen that you can't prepare for. You have things unexpected. You may have a loved one pass away, and, and it's heartbreaking to me to hear stories about uh, people who will, uh, who, who will wake up in the middle of the night and lean over and, and reach for somebody and, and realize, oh, of course, they've gone on to heaven. But, but that was your normal. That was your routine for so many years. And, and we just don't, we don't like changes. We like things to be the same. We like them to be predictable. We like the security of knowing that our normal is our normal. And in, in our life, we haven't had anything really uh, terrible happen, but just in the last couple of years, uh, really a year ago at this time, we had a different house, different schedule, uh, different, every, everything in our life was different, and two of our boys still lived with us. And, uh, and one of them moved away, another, the other one went to college, came back with us for the summer, but uh, in just the last few years, our daughter got so we're, we were left literally on Christmas a couple years ago for the first time uh, since our kids started uh, being born. On Christmas Day, we realized we don't have any of our kids with us this Christmas. <laughs> they're, they're all someplace else, and it wasn't normal. And uh, so we went camping instead. We'll show you them, you know. And so what I'm saying is that sometimes there are things, and, and in the ministry, our ministry completely changed. And so now, uh, the, the same thing routine that I had had all those years, for several years, uh, all of a sudden I wake up now and I'm like, where am I? I'm going to a cave someplace. I was like, oh yeah, it's a prophecy here. There's no big windows in it, you know. I slept really well. But, but you know, my alarm clock's not over there anymore. Now I've got my alarm set on my phone and it's over here someplace. And, and the kitchen's in a different place and I've got a different brand of coffee now. And, 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 and everything was just completely different. And, and it literally was a new normal for us. And now just recently, I said this a couple, two, three weeks ago, uh, we, we moved into the parsonage. So now again, there's more adjustments for us. And, and even there, there are things from time to time as they continue to, to move around. We'll end up from one room into another room and things like that. But it's all good. Uh, sometimes our new normal is you find out you get cancer or you find out that a loved one of yours uh, has been uh, in, in some sort of an accident or has some uh, health condition, something like that. So 
you've been hearing over and over again. And here's the thing. Everything I've talked about so far are things that we just have to accept sometimes as, as some things that are normal. I've always liked the uh, what they call the serenity prayer, or at least the, the truth that it teaches. Uh, and, and that is, you pray, Lord, give me the uh, courage to change the things that I can, and the uh, serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, and give me the wisdom to know the difference. Because there are things in your life, if you don't like them, maybe you don't like them because God wants you to do something about it. He wants you to change it. He wants you to fix it. He wants you to uh, to, to, to take hold of it and, and, and get it to where, you, where it needs to be. But there's also some situations that you don't like, you wouldn't have chosen, you wish they would change, but you realize that you can't. There's certain things that you can't, there's no undo button on too many things in life. It would be nice if you can just click something and, and, uh, and, and have it go back in time and have things not have happened. But that's not the reality of it, and there are times in life where, where the thing to do is to realize, okay, this is something that I don't like, I wish I could change. If I could change it, God give me the courage to change it if I could, but now I understand that this is something that God is not going to, uh, it's not going to be my lot for him, it's not going to be in his plan for this to change. I'm going to have to have the grace to accept it. And now you just have to decide whenever something happens that you don't like, you just have to figure out which one of those ten things they are. Is this something I can change or is this something that I have to accept? And so the normal that I talk about most things, there are things that are going to happen to people. Time it goes by, things change, and what your routine is, uh, is going to change. As you get married, as you start having kids, as kids get old, as they go to school the first day, as they move off to college, as they start getting married, and you end up, maybe you have to move into a nursing home, or your uh, spouse has to move into a nursing home, or, or all these different things start unfolding in the course of time. Those are things you can't do much about. But, and, and so what I'm talking about, when I said the new normal, most of you were thinking in your mind an image of a TV screen saying, we have to accept this as our new normal. I mean, you told me at this point, we've talked about this tonight. We're trying to shake somebody's hand and sing to them. Well, no, we're not supposed to do that, right? Because it's our new normal now. We're supposed to live in fear, right? We're supposed to uh, stay locked up. We're supposed to keep ourselves in a space for the rest of our life just to make sure we don't get a germ. And I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but not as much as you might want me to be, right? I understand, I really understand most of what was done at one point, somebody sincerely saw it as being something that was necessary. And I'll be honest with you, you, you go back and you look at the history of the things that I uh, have, have posted on our website, it's on there right now, things that we have said, all the announcements that we have made, we have taken the health and, and safety and security of our church members. We care about you more than the government cares about you. Of course, we want you to be protected. We want you to be safe. And we're still doing several things that we think are probably something that we can take off someday. But 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 I'm not quite ready to say a new normal is let's not have church anymore. I'm not ready to say our new normal is and uh, now maybe maybe handshaking is something that'll take some time to come back. Some people will never quit doing it. Hugging, I don't really care if that ever comes back. I was never comfortable with that anyway, so I'm white, you know. But, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I had a preacher one time, he said that when he started preaching, he said that he, his policy was, he said, I won't hug a girl between the ages of 5 and 50. You know, and uh, nowadays you can't hug kids anymore either. You get accused of something. But he said at one point, he said, let me change that. He said, 50-year-olds are looking better than me all the time now. So he changed it from 6 to 60. And then when he was in his 60s, he said, you know, I'm just not going to hug anybody anymore. It just it, it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but your new normal, I'm just saying, I just started getting a little bit preachy with that. I'm not going to say that our new normal is that we have to live in fear because God doesn't want us to live in fear. I'm not going to say our new normal is watch us on Facebook and don't come assemble with us. If that's the only option you have, and that's the best and safest thing that you have, if it's that or not have any uh, worship experience at all, yeah, keep doing it. We're going to keep broadcasting it. But I am going to say that I'm not going to accept the new normal being that we have 30 or 40 people here on Sunday morning. I like our new normal to be having 100 people here on Sunday morning. 
You know, maybe not next Sunday, if it happens, praise the Lord. But but I want us to go forward. I want us to say our new normal isn't going to be something that the government told us that we had to dial back our activities. President, uh, uh, what's his name? I almost said Bush or Carter. It's been a while. But, uh, Trump, that's right. <laughs> and uh, people, the, 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 our president said uh, just, just a couple of days ago, and, and he didn't mince his words. It's the first time I've ever seen him do that. <laughs> but, but he said, no, churches are going to be essential. Since some of these crazy governors let people go to abortion clinics and, and liquor stores, they don't let them go to church. I'm going to stop that. That stops now, he said. And so our new normal is going to be that churches are going to thrive across our land. Our new normal is going to be that we are not going to back up and back down and be controlled, uh, and not in the medical sense. I'm talking about the globalist sense. I'm talking about the big government sense. I'm not going to have my new normal be giving up my freedoms and my liberties for some bureaucrat that wants to have more power in my life than our Constitution guarantees me to have. I'm not going to accept that as a new normal. There's, a, there's another phrase, and I got a couple other phrases I might say too, but, but there's another phrase to go with the message tonight. This is where I'm going with this. Uh, at the very beginning, I heard all these caring people like uh, politicians and uh, athletes and the uh, some of the most important members of our society, actors, you know, and they were coming out making sure that we were all going to be okay. Oh, we, we care. And you know what? This is a phrase that you heard a lot. We're in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. Yeah, people who lost their businesses are in the same boat as your senator is. The representatives of your state, your your, your uh, local county government, you're all in the same boat. Are they losing their paychecks when you tell them that they can't go to work? Are they shutting their things down? Are they missing meals? Are they are they not able to get their hair cut before they stand in front of the, the TV screen and tell us how much they care about us? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they still have their yachts. They still have all that kind of stuff. A bunch of hypocrites will allow them to do this. They're not they're anywhere near the same boat that most of the people that they want to. And we don't care. You know, maybe I'm off on this, but I don't need Madonna to tell me that everything's going to be okay. I've got my Bible to tell me that I'm in the same boat with Jesus. And these disciples, in the story that we read, were literally in the same boat with God. They were literally physically in a boat that Jesus Christ himself, in his human body, was in a boat. And they were in the boat with him. That's what you call being in the same boat. And they were in this boat. You would think that they would feel pretty well protected and pretty safe. Yeah, we are in the same boat with Jesus. And so we think, all right, as long as Jesus is with us, as long as our eyes are on him, and these people literally, physically, their eyes were on the Lord, they would, they, we would have thought those people don't have anything to worry about. And they were probably thinking, everything's going to be good in our lives because Jesus is close to us. And when I got saved, I heard some encouraging stories about how the Lord was going to be with me for the rest of my life, wherever I went. And I'm going to be honest with you, I kind of mistakenly thought that that meant I was never going to have any storms come in my life. I thought, I'm in a boat with Jesus, nothing bad can happen to him, and so he's not going to let anything bad happen to me. <laughs> And that's probably what these disciples thought. Now, to be fair to them, they had not read this chapter yet. <laughs> All they knew was that they were in the boat, and Jesus said, let's go to the other side, uh, let's take a little trip there. And so they uh, sent the multitude away, and they got in the boat, and uh, the storm came up in verse 37, a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. So these people, we're telling them, guys, don't worry. Jesus is in the boat with you. This is that story where he gets up and speaks, peace be still. We have an advantage that his disciples didn't have here. They didn't know he was going to say, peace be still. They knew that Jesus was with them. They knew that they were scared. They knew they were panicked. They knew that they were probably going to be doomed because they were men of the sea. A couple of them were had been professional sea men, and they were here in this boat, and it was windy, and, 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 and the waves were so high that it was uh, that, that, that the boat actually began to fill with water. 
And so they were pretty well panicked about it, and rightly so. Understandably, they were scared and they were concerned for their lives. Even with Jesus being physically present, the storm did threaten them. And sometimes, when a storm comes in their life, our first instinct is to say, Carest thou not that we perish? Lord, don't you care about me? How can a loving God allow something like this to happen to somebody so wonderful as me? I mean, I've said that before. I thought, no, maybe I've done something wrong. God, are you mad at me? What? I thought I prayed today. What? What happened? Why is something happening to me that's not got frosting on? You know? And uh, but 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 God, for one thing, he knows things that we don't know. Jesus already knew that he was gonna say, peace be still. And that's why he was sleeping when they were panicking. And so, while these guys were in the boat, in the ship, with the Lord, and the storm came, I just, I want to pause just to say that you can be doing everything right, the storm might still come in your life, but that's not the time to panic, that's not the time to lose your faith, that's not your time to accuse him of not caring about you, that's the best time at all to realize, he's in here with me. <laughs> you know what I might have said, if I, if I could go back in time, I, I hope my imagination went wild and stuff, okay, it went wild. If I could go back in time and I could go tell these guys, assuming they spoke English, right? I always have to say that. <laughs> I go back on the boat and I tell these guys, think about the prophecies of the Messiah. What is the Messiah going to do? What do the scriptures say about the end of his life? Is he going to die in a shipwreck? <laughs> no, hey, he's got to go to the cross. You are with Jesus. Jesus is not going down with this ship. Jesus is not going, he, Jesus' life is not threatened by this. Jesus is the darling of heaven. Jesus is the uh, one who has, uh, uh, has already been there. He's the master of the seas. He's the one who created it. When Jonah was in his uh, little storm, that he had a little storm, nothing. When he was going through the storm of Jonah, and people started figuring out, let's start, let's pray to all of our gods and see what happens. And they go to Jonah, and they, they cast lots, and they said, what, it's you? What God do you serve? He said, oh, the one who created the seas. And I've offended him. I'm running away from him. I haven't been acting right. He's probably mad at me. You know, that they knew, even those heathens, once they realized, wait a minute, you know who created these things, and you're not serving him, you're not trusting him, you're not obeying him, and, and he said, yeah, you guys don't mind me, you just throw me overboard. <laughs> you know? And so they threw him overboard, and, and, and the calm uh, came in that situation. So here you've got a situation where literally, physically, uh, Jonah had to say, I serve the God who is the creator. Jesus said, I am the creator. I am the one who made all this. I'm the one who gave all you life. I'm the one who called you to be my disciples. I'm the one who's ministering with you and serving with you and, and, and alongside of you. And I've got something to teach you here. We're in this boat, and we're in the same boat. We're in this boat together, and we don't even have an ice cream freezer here on this boat. You know, as we're in the same boat. And we're moving down this boat, and, and, and Jesus says, all right, well, I'm going to teach you guys something. I'll see you later. I'm going to go ahead and fill and uh, they might look like, oh, what is it? Why is it going to sleep? And the storm comes and it starts to, to fill in water faster than they can bail it out. That's never a good thing. And so they said, oh, this is really bad. This is so bad. We are so desperate. We're going to get Jesus involved in it. Does that sound familiar with you? Now, everybody, you're really, really desperate. Maybe you'll have to go see if you can you know, talk to the Lord about it. But they finally go back and they wake Jesus up and they say, Jesus, uh, there's a storm out here. He says, no, you won't be able to live. Yeah, but it's a bad storm. The boat's filling up with water and we're all going to die and you don't even seem to care. He says, well, you're right, I don't care. But not in the same sense that you think. I don't care about the storm because all I got to do is get up and say, hush! Or like they say in Georgia, please steal! Uh, that's where that came from, I'm sure. He just got up and said, please steal! And, and the storm said, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. <laughs> and so, uh, so, so that's what, yeah, Jesus cared about them, but Jesus didn't care about the storm. He's bigger than the storm. He knew that the storm and the winds and the waves and the sea was going to obey him. And so uh, we would say to them, don't worry. Jesus is with you. Everything's going to be okay. How can you fear? Look, he's so calm. Look at him. He's sleeping. And yet they, 
I guess if I were them, I, I don't know what I would have said, but I think that they had a lot of nerve to accuse him, or at least question whether or not he even cared about them. So he responded to that by saying, hey guys, I need to talk to you. <laughs> All right, see, would you storm? Would you believe me quiet? I need to talk to my disciples for a minute. <laughs> I need to calm you down before I can calm them down. They're not listening to me because their eyes are on the storm instead of the fact that they're in the same boat with me. So if you don't mind, I want to ask you to go away and just be still and just let there be peace. And it wasn't just like, it, oh, hey, look, it's getting better. It was like, it was a great calm. <sighs> the sea just had a great sigh of relief. Now he goes back to his disciples and he says, now what was that you were talking about? What was the storm that you thought that I was going to really be so concerned about? What, 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 remind me again what it is that you thought your life was in danger while I'm this close to you. And uh, he said, why is it that you have no faith? What's up with your faith? And so uh, that's what they did. They, they asked a question in verse 41. They feared exceedingly and said one another, what manner of man is this? And even the wind and the sea obeyed him. I can answer that question. Uh, if you went to Matthew chapter 6, I guess we have time to do this. Matthew chapter 6, didn't have very many announcements tonight, so we're still good. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, uh, nor yet for your body, what you shall, be, shall, you shall put on, is the life, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not you, do they reap nor gather in barns? Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, and are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? This is Matthew 5, verse 28. Now, and why take ye thought for raiment? Instead of the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek your heavenly Father, know that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You got enough going on today. You don't have to worry too much about tomorrow, right? And in fact, we heard a special this morning. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, right? <laughs> but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. He's the one who's going to take care of us. What manner of man is this? He's the one who calms the storm. He's the, he's the manner of man uh, who can calm the waves, still the storm, feed the sparrow, adorn the lily, heal the sick, make the lame to walk, make the blind to see, make the deaf to hear, make the dead to rise. He is the great I am, and he is in the boat with you. He's in the same boat that you are in. That's what manner of man is in the same boat with you. Creator of the of the, the, the uh, uh, of the seas, the creator of the, the wind, he is the one who cares about you. First Peter five seven says, "Cast your cares on him. Cast your cares on him, for he careth for you." Uh, Psalm thirty seven verse twenty five says, "I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or deceived, begging bread." We're in the same boat with the disciples. Jesus is with us. The storms may still come. He goes through these valleys with us. And I think that these, when he said, why do you have no faith? I think the next time they probably, the next time they went to accuse him of not caring about him, they remembered that storm. They remembered what they were going to say. You remember when we were in the same boat with Jesus? Yeah, we're still in the same boat with Jesus. And we're still in the same boat with Jesus tonight. We're still in the same boat with each other. We can help each other out a little bit. If one of us gets a little bit shaky on our feet, we'll say, look, I've been here before. I know we're going to make it. Let me encourage you now that it's your turn to struggle. Let's all, let's all uh, edify one another. Let's all be here as a family that cares about each other. But let's all make sure that we remember we can do that because we're in the same boat with Jesus. Jesus is with us. And the storms may still come. The valleys may still uh, uh, pass beneath our feet. But he's going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with us, uh, so we should fear no evil. Uh, when Jesus doesn't respond the way that we want him to, uh, eventually he'll make everything all right when he's good and ready. That's the hard part sometimes. He, he's the one who gets to decide when it's the right time to do it. 
<laughs> right? But when he says, all right, I think you're ready to learn the lesson now, and then you can feel foolish for not having trust in him. And I hope we learn a little bit deeper for the next one that comes along. I don't know if he gets aggravated with us, or if it abuses him, or if he just gets used to it, expects it of us, but I am glad that he's very patient with us. These were his own disciples. You know, I love Jesus. I, so I talk to him and listen to him, but I am, there's only been a few people of all the people who have ever lived since creation who actually were in the same place and at the same time when Jesus lived on earth. And these were people who knew what his voice sounded like. These were people who heard him say, I know I said, what did he say? Let's stay here. And he said, please, please, yeah! What do you say? Be still. Well, all we have to do is imagine. But those people knew. They were there. They knew. They, they, they heard him say it. They heard him breathing. I mean, they, they saw him stretching when he got up. So, oh, okay, all right. I wouldn't quite know my nap yet, but I'll go ahead and calm the storm and it'll help your faith a little bit. <laughs> These people were people who literally, physically were there with him. And I long to be that close to him to where I can have peace in my storm, where it would be that real to me. Next time somebody says, I understand, we're in single, we're all in this together, this is our new normal. <laughs> you know, depending on who they are and how much confidence I have in them, I may or not be comforted by their words of uh, encouragement. All right, we'll just raise your taxes, or you be okay. <laughs> we'll just print some more money, that way you won't go hungry, right? Yeah, that makes me feel good. You can't go to work, but we'll, we'll pull some out of thin air. We're going to give up for us. See, you just changed the sermon. It wasn't time to change it. <laughs> Can we just be reminded again uh, tonight that he is in the boat with us? He's got everything under control, and he will never leave us or forsake us. And he's trying to teach us something, maybe even by allowing us, while we're still in the same boat, with him. He cares about it, but he wants to teach us that we can trust him the things that we don't understand. Many things about tomorrow I don't understand. My, my message tonight is just this. <laughs> and maybe that will even help you remember that. Next year, time you hear somebody say, oh, we're people. Especially if it's a politician. I don't, I don't mean to be picking on politicians, but they have no clue. We're for the people. They have no literal clue what most people have to live through. Can you imagine having a job that you couldn't get fired for? Even if you were a complete moron, right? All you can do is get voted out, and you have to live in a district where there's a bunch of other complete morons to keep open. Right? Now, I'm trying not to change the focus right now. Uh, it's, I'm tempted to, to pray for you. Right now, I'm on our hearts thinking about this. The Lord loves us. He cares about us. Sometimes storms come in our lives. He may not cause them. We may bring them on ourselves. It may be just part of this testing to prove us. Uh, we don't know why, but we do know that he loves us. He cares about us, and he is. He understands. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet yeah, without sin. So he's been where we are. He lives where we live. He, he, he did get weary where he had to sleep. He, he did thirst. He did hunger. He understood what it was like. He's lived in a human body before. He knew what pain felt like. He knew what betrayal felt like. He even knew what death feels like. And so why can't we tonight say, Lord, I'm glad that you're in the boat with me. And I'm really glad that I'm in the boat with you. And whatever storm comes along in this life, don't ever let me forget that if I call on you, I don't want to accuse you of not caring about me. I want to trust you. I want to hold your hand. And whether you calm the storm or whether you get me safely through the storm, that's up to you. You're driving. I'm trusting you. We're in the same boat with the Lord. Lord, I pray tonight that you'd help us as your people. I'm not aware of anybody here tonight that doesn't know for sure that they're saved. If that is someone that doesn't know uh, about their salvation, don't know if they uh, are on their way to heaven, pray that they would seek uh, the truth and the answer. Would they contact us if they're here tonight, they could come and um, and, and come to the, to the altar and, and find the word of God and the answers with somebody who knows, cares, and will help them find their way. 
I think mostly tonight, at least in this building, there are people who already kind of wanted to nod their head in agreement that you care about us, and you love us, and that you trust you. But at the same time, we can identify with these faithless disciples. The times when we should be aware of your presence with us, uh, we still get our eyes on the storm sometimes. Peter, when he saw you, he was able to walk on the water. When he saw the wind, he began to sink. I pray that you help us to keep our eyes on you tonight. And I just uh, thank you so much for loving us, caring about us in spite of ourselves. We want to we want to trust you tonight. I guess if I want to say what should our prayer tonight be, should we pray that we can trust you more? Let's stand together as we play an invitation song, verse 2.